This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Brenda Novak on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Bookstore on the Beach. And, uh, you know, this show is all about book lovers and and lovers of writing. And, uh, you know, when we get to talk about a book that involves a bookstore, that's... uh, you know, it can't be more in our wheelhouse. <laughs> I know you're going to love this book and it needs to be in your to be read pile for sure. Uh, going into the spring and summer season. Uh, welcome to the show, Brenda. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, Brenda, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, actually, I came to it a little later than most. I didn't grow up thinking that I would be a writer or dreaming of being a writer. I thought I was left-brained and was going to school for business. Um, And I really felt I was raised in a very traditional religious household and was taught that my duty was to support my husband. And so I planned on being a stay-at-home mom and raising children and continuing with that lifestyle. I'm no longer uh, part of that religion anymore. Things have changed quite a bit, but... While I was uh, in there, I I found it necessary to work anyway, even though we were taught to stay home with our children. Um, My husband had a business that was uh, successful at first, and then everything kind of went upside down in the market, and he had 30 homes in various stages of construction that um, the appraisals for them, they were all pre-sold, so they weren't spec homes, Um, so you know you got to give him that, but Anyway, the the appraisals were coming in below our cost because the market dropped so far from the time we started them till the time we finished them. So he was just taking a bloodbath. And um, I, of course, was panicked. And I was working as a loan officer trying to help. And we had a daycare person that came into our house. And I caught her drugging my children with cough syrup and Tylenol. (laughs) Well, I only had three of my five at the time. But anyway, I caught her doing that to get them to sleep all day so that she could work um, or watch you know, TV and just relax and it would be an easy job. And so of course I was totally freaked out by that. Um, when I found it in my baby's bottle, especially, you know, it's, it was very upsetting. And so I confronted her and, and it all came out. But anyway, that, that made me feel, you know, so much mother's guilt because I had left them vulnerable to this person that I thought I could trust. She was also part of our church anyway. So I quit my job to stay home with them. But as I mentioned, it was not a good financial picture. Um, so I was super worried and wondering what I could do. I couldn't leave them. So I had to do something that I could do with them. And my sister was, um, she had just finished Jude Devereaux's night in shining armor. And she sent it to me and said, Oh, you're going to love this book. You got to read it. And so it it swept me away during this dark time. At least it gave me some, you know, a reprieve from the worry because I got very caught up in this book. And as I finished it, I remember thinking, I wonder if I could do this. This is something I could do while my children napped or, you know, if they were out playing in the backyard, I could sit out with them and have my computer. And so I was, um, you know, kind of the light went on then. And I I had always loved historicals. And so I, I grew up on Kathleen Woodwiss and, I just really loved her work and I loved Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. And, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to write a historical, which was kind of crazy. 
um, because I had, um, you know, the internet wasn't what it is today. I had no way to research. So I would have to wait for my husband to come home and he was working night and day. The poor guy, he'd get home like at 830 at night because he was trying so hard to save his business. And I, you know, shove whatever child wasn't asleep yet at him. And I'd rush out the door and I'd go down to Sac State and I'd pump that copier through fill, filled with nickels and dimes trying to get enough material to take <laughs> home with me to do the research. So it was an interesting time in my life. But that's how I came into writing. So what what year would that have been roughly? Um, that was back in 94, 95. OK, so, yeah, the 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 market was vastly different then. the um, uh, technology was vastly different then. That's uh, what, um, you know, now when when someone has an idea um, and, you know, I, I think I've got a, a book in me, you can go on the Internet and you can just start searching, um, you know, how do I write a book? How do I get published? How do I? get an agent, you know, and there's just a wealth of information out there. Um, not right. that that's made it easier. Uh, in, in fact, it might actually be harder now, but, but you can get lots of information. Like how did you start navigating those waters? Well, that was the thing. I didn't know one other person. I wasn't part of any writer groups or anything. I, I just thought, you know, I was out there by myself raising my little kids for the first five. I, I wrote the book. It took me about five years. And so it, obviously it didn't save our financial picture, but it did give me something that I was super excited about. Once I got into it, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is my calling in life. Like I loved it. And so it, it created, you know, a real nice uplift during kind of a time of carnage. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I just, there, it was a more difficult time and it was also an easier time uh, in that it was discoverability probably might've been easier once you could get published, but it was harder to get published. As you just mentioned, you know, now anybody can get published. I, I could write anything I wanted and immediately upload it on Amazon without editing, without anything, if I wanted to. I'm not saying that's sure, what sure. a lot of people do. I'm just saying that the door is open. There's no right, longer right. these gatekeepers. And the, so the door's wide open. So in a way, that's such an exciting thing because you no longer have to try and fit through that very skinny gate because they've always been very selective, right? So that was the challenge when I started was, you know, how to get published and I didn't know. I knew nothing about it. I didn't even know that you couldn't simultaneously submit, meaning you send your behemoth of a manuscript to New York and you have to pay this money. You know, it was expensive because it was heavy. And because I, I was feeling it, right? I didn't have any money. And you had to send a self-addressed stamped envelope back. And it could take a year before anybody ever saw it, if they ever responded. And yet you were supposed to do wait, you were supposed to wait before submitting to the next publisher. And so it was just really unwieldy and difficult and kind of a, a crazy way to do business because it, it just was so, you know, ineffectual and clunky. And so I, that was the time that, that I got started. So there were no gatekeepers. But if you could get published and the publisher spent some money to help push you, it was probably easier to get some discoverability because now, obviously, if you flood the market because there's no more gate, so everybody can get in. It's going to be harder with all these voices in that marketplace going, I've written a book, I've written a book, read mine, read mine. And it just the cacophony gets so loud. And I think it's tough on readers to to narrow it down and figure out, OK, who am I going to go with in this? <laughs> now, were you a uh, were you a bookish uh, kid, uh, Brenda? That, you know, were you constantly reading? I know that you said that you never pictured yourself as a writer. But had you immersed yourself in, um, you know, in books and so that when that idea did come to you, that you sort of had a, a foundation, a base to build upon? Absolutely. I mean, when I was very little, I didn't like reading at all when I was being taught. I thought this is, you know, terrible, boring. And then they took us to the library, my teacher, the school library, and they, uh, her and, and her assistant, she had a student teacher, they encouraged us to get a book. And well, they actually demanded that we get a book and read it. And next week we would turn it in and get another book. And I happened to land upon, I didn't know what I was doing, but I just happened to land upon the shelf of classics. And I think uh, my first one was Jane Eyre. And then I moved on to The Secret Garden and, and I went on from there. And I loved it. Suddenly I was like, this is reading. And, and so I would hide under the table so my mother wouldn't see me and give me a task, you know, because I just wanted to read. I didn't come from a mother who read or a family who read. 
Um, so, and I would just secret myself away in these wonderful worlds and let them carry me away. And then we moved when I was uh, about 11 to a, a place where there was no longer a neighborhood really. And so I knew no one. We moved at the first of the summer. I knew no one. I'm a you know 10 year old girl. So books were my only friends. Um, so I did gain, you know, a great deal of, uh, enjoyment. And I really learned the, the joy of reading during that time period. So I feel as though when I started to write, yeah, I had done um, some significant reading. And I feel as though those people who learn from example, you know, that's my recommendation actually is read, 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 because you can read all the how to write books you want. And maybe that's helpful to some. It's not helpful to me because it takes everything I do in my subconscious as I create and tries to schlep it over to my conscious uh, conscience side, conscious side, sorry. And <laughs> I start juggling all these things, trying to, trying to make sure all the, the, um, you know, knobs are turned just right. Instead of just writing from the heart and putting my passion in it and doing the things I do instinctively. So to me, reading other fiction has been more helpful than any type of how to book. Of course, everybody has a different path. That's just, you know, how it affects me. L Looking back now, Brenda, you, you have published more than 60 books. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you, you've been busy since 1994. Um, looking back now at that that experience of writing that first book compared to like the bookstore on the beach, I, I'm sure that by now you've settled into um, a, a routine of sorts. You Your creative process is – uh, cemented and solidified. You, you go about the process in a very particular way, the way that Brenda Novak writes a book. Um, but looking back then, um, can, can you see the trajectory of how your creative process has changed um, the way that you have settled into how you think about stories, where, where characters come from, where settings come from, where plot comes from um, looking back on that very first experience how do you how do you trace your traject your trajectory from there to now? Well, the learning curve in my first book was pretty steep. You know, I, I yeah. just jumped in the next day. I didn't. I had never gone to school for it. I'd never read a how to book. I, like I said, I I didn't even know that you know RWA existed. I didn't find RWA until I had finished my first book, and then I was like, okay, what's the next step? And I had a friend in my church tell me, well, do you know about this organization called Romance Writers of America? And they have this big, you know, conference every year and they move it around the country. And I scraped to the, together the money to go. I was pregnant with my fifth child on my first RWA conference. And I remember as I stepped into that hotel with 2000 women going every which direction at this conference, I was just overwhelmed with excitement. And I was just, I knew I had found what I needed to get to the next step. And so it was Super, super thrilling. As far as, um, you know, what starting until now changes in my process, I just feel as though the more experience you get, the more confidently you can tackle your craft. Um, I think you've been down the road a few times, turned out a few books, you know, you know, generally what your readers like, what, what may upset them, you know, um, by then to kind of trust your instinct and not let the critics get you down. Um, so I, I feel as though, yes, I've, you know, practiced helps you get better at any skill. And I've done nothing but right for 20 years. I mean, I, I do it every day. I absolutely love it. And so certainly has gotten easier. Although I will say each new book is a challenge, right? Because you want to outdo anything you've ever done before. So each new book, you put your heart and soul in trying to, to go one step higher, one step higher. Um, so yeah, I mean, now, now I would say, you know, I write three books a year. So the biggest difference is probably just that I write much quicker and more confidently. Brenda, I love to um, to hear about the beginnings of things with people. Um, when you start a new project, um, you know, one moment the bookstore on the beach does not exist. The, and then either a character walks on the stage of your mind or you think of a setting or maybe a, a plot point and then characters start kind of filling in that plot. How does a new book begin for you? For me, it always starts with the conflict. The conflict is the engine that drives the train of the story. And so that's what starts for me. I want something interesting that I can, a problem that my characters are going to solve or face. And I want it to be interesting. And I want to people it 
with characters who that challenge would be most challenging too, right? Because you want to push your characters. That's how you get that really satisfying come from behind type of win at the end where you get that feeling of exaltation after you close a good book. It's because generally these characters have really faced you know, something difficult. I'll use uh, the book that we just read in my, in Brenda Novak's online book group um, on Facebook. We just featured Kristen Hanna for March and read The Four Winds. And that book is, I think, a perfect example of what I'm talking about, where it just had a tremendous conflict. And those characters really went through a lot. But you really get to know the characters and you are inspired by their perseverance and their grit. And it sort of even helps you tackle your own problems in life. It's it's uh, cathartic in that way. It's inspiring in that way. And so I, I too tend to write with a lot of conflict. And to me, that's what makes a book interesting. If there's not enough conflict, to me, it's like watching paint dry. I'm, I'm not interested in that book. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. So, Brenda, um, you have written a, a number of series um, as as well as standalones. Um, how do you, when you begin a project... Um, how do you decide, is this going to continue a story that I've, that I've, uh, already started in the past? Uh, do I have a, a brand new, uh, idea that, that will only, um, that, that one volume will, uh, will sufficiently tell that story. How do you decide what's going to be a longer story or, you know, that this can be, um, completely satisfied in, in one book? Well, um, I typically that's a decision that I make in partnership with my publisher. So I know in advance if I'm writing part of a series or if I'm writing a standalone novel as the bookstore on the beach is. Um, because I do write with a lot of conflict, it does easily lend itself to series because when you have a lot to work with, um, then there's a lot of places to go. And that's that's what I mean by having a strong conflict. Um, so, yeah, that's just a decision that I make before I start to write, whether it's going to be. Uh, a standalone, or it's going to be part of one of my series. Gotcha. So, so tell me about the new book. Where, where, what was the first idea that came to you about this book? Well, I was reading a actually an online article that caught my attention of uh, parents who had a son that lived in their basement, and uh, I got I get the impression that he was you know early twenties or maybe mid twenties, and he was sort of a computer nerd, a gamer. And he was really good at infiltrating these these terrorist sites somehow. I don't know how the FBI he got on the FBI's radar, and he started helping them out in infiltrating these sites. And he got really caught up in it, and his parents weren't totally clear on what he was doing because it was kind of secret. And he decides he's going to go over to Ukraine. And I don't know whether that was at the behest of the government. The article wasn't totally clear on all points. But anyway, he goes over there. And um, nobody knows really what he was doing, but he didn't come back. 
all his parents knew is that he was going over to this part of the world. And when he didn't come back and they could no longer contact him, of course, they were in a panic and they're looking for their son and they're, they're trying to figure out what he was doing and, and trying to sleuth out, you know, why he, he went over there in the first place. And they figure out that he was helping the FBI in some way. I don't know if he was a direct employee um, or if he just got some type of, I don't know, payment. Uh, but he was over there and they, they could never find their son. They went over there searching for him and they don't know what happened to him. So this is the article that I read and I thought, you know, that would be such an interesting conflict for a woman who's married to a man who may get caught up in something like that. Maybe he's an attorney and he's from there so he knows the language or he, you know, he's, his parents immigrated from over there and so he has family there. And so they see him as a good candidate and he starts working with them and starts helping them. And then he goes over to help them and he just disappears. And it's all secret. She can't, she doesn't know what he's doing. And so she can't find him. And yet she has these two teenage children. She has to tell them, you know, what, what why she can't find their father where he's gone. Um, and then so that that's the story, the backstory to the main character, Autumn Divock. And she leaves that that's at the beginning of the story. You know that he has gone missing. She searched for over a year tirelessly, you know, still loves and wants her family back. And she heads to the little beach side town where she was raised to work in the bookstore owned by her mother and her aunt just to gain some peace and recoup and be with family and try to get beyond this terrible tragedy in her life. And of course, she runs into um, a young man who is now divorced that she, you know, really had this huge crush on in high school and he's interested. And, you know, as this relationship develops, she thinks, OK, I've searched a year and a half. He must be dead. Surely he must be dead. But am I being disloyal? Am I being wrong for moving on? Should I not do this? What do I tell my children? So it created a really interesting conflict to explore, not knowing whether her husband was dead or not, whether he may appear one day. Um, and yet she's falling in love with this other man. So that's just one of the there are a couple sub subplots in there. Her mother is held, uh, you know, hit a terrible secret for years that she, of course, discovers. And her daughter's going through a really difficult um, decision that will be, you know, impact her whole life. Uh, so anyway, it was just really fun to delve into these various conflicts and these three generation of women and their relationships and and how they get beyond, uh, you know, their challenges. Brenda, is it fun for you um, to to torture your characters the way that you do? I mean, no, nothing could could be more unsettling than uh, a missing spouse. Uh, it, you know, you, you've you've grieved, you've looked, you, you've done everything you possibly can. And then this other person comes in and now all the emotions start all over again. There's some mystery and, and, and autumn is, is obviously torn. Um, how fun is it for you as a writer to, to play with other people's <laughs> emotions like that? Um, I don't know that I'd call it fun so much as intriguing to me. Like it captures my imagination trying to solve this problem and figure out how this person would feel and how she should deal with it. I love morally gray areas because that's where we really can branch out and try and figure out what's the right thing in this. What should this person be doing? Um, and so I, I do really love a good, strong conflict like that, but it's more, I think about curiosity and trying to work it around in my mind to figure out what would be the most fair scenario. How would you get beyond this um, and continue to live and find happiness again? Brenda, do you consider yourself a uh, a pantser or a plotter? I, I know with as many books as you've written, I'm sure your process has has honed, uh, you know, to a sharp point. Um, but, you know, how much planning goes into a book before you actually start writing? Well, I am what you call a pantser, which is interesting because I think it's, uh, you know, I've heard many, many other authors speak, especially male authors who will say, you've got to have a plot. You've got to have it all plotted out. I mean, an outline, you know, for your plot. And, and I, I, then I get nervous thinking, oh, I'm doing it all wrong. I'm doing it all wrong. But I think everybody has a process that works for them. For me, if I outline ahead of time, I've told the story. I'm completely bored with it. As I get into the book, I try to force my characters down that path. And it just becomes very flat, emotionless writing. And so to imbue it with the sense of wonder that I feel as I write, I kind of have to open that up and let the characters lead me through the story, what they would do, how they would react to this conflict. So again, I use the conflict as the engine, and then I develop my characters around that, um, which then, of course, results in the plot. So 
uh, for me, it just sort of works best that way. I then I, I, maybe it's because I'm a big blabbermouth, and if I know, for instance, if I'm writing a suspense novel, because I've done a number of those too, you know, if I know who the killer is at the end or whatever surprise I'm trying to spring on the reader, I inevitably leak it out there because I just I'm not very good at keeping secrets, so I can't know either. And then at the end, I'm surprised, and I, I think, oh my gosh, of course he was he was here all the time. So I think your subconscious <laughs> kind of knows more than you do and launches out ahead of you because. I'm grateful that it hasn't cost me, um, you know, hardly any rewriting through the years. Yeah. Well, you know, some some very famous pantsers have uh, have said uh, about plotting. You, you can't do it that way because there's no excitement in the story left. You, the writer needs to be discovering the story along with the reader. Uh, and and there's there's truth uh, in that. And and then some plotters will say. Well, what happens when you're pantsing and um, you you take a wrong turn somewhere and then you've just written yourself into a corner? Um, Have you ever have you ever found that to be the truth? Have you ever been in the middle of a story and and it just doesn't go anywhere or it doesn't resolve like you wanted it to and you find yourself stuck with a story? No, no, actually, I I have never ran into that problem. And I think it's because. Writer's block for me is a positive thing, and it turns on the second I take a wrong turn. I mean, I can't get very far, very far in. It'll just dry up. It's as if I'm trying to squeeze out, you know, I've got, I, I, I got to squeeze out this, you know, story that I'm trying to write, and it gets harder and harder and harder, and it, it just to a stop till it grinds to a stop, and that's what tells me, oh, I, I've made a mistake, and um, I. Uh, all I have to do at that point is go back and kind of treat it like a plumber would pipes. You know, it's like a solid here. It's solid here. It's, you know, Oh, here's where the leak is. This is what I got to fix. So usually that it stops me before I go too far. Gotcha. Um, what would you say, Brenda, to to people that don't think uh, that they are fans of the genre um, that, that you write in, um, you know, uh, Maybe people look at at romance and and you know look at that narrowly. What would you say um, that people might love about the genre that they might not know about? Um, well, you know, first I, I'd like to say a little something on the criticisms it typically gets. One is that it's formulaic, but there's nothing more formulaic than any other genre. Think of mystery. Think of um, thriller, like there's certain conventions a reader expects when they pick up that sure. book, which is, I guess you could loosely define it as a formula, right? So it's no more formulaic than any other type of genre writing. The other criticism that we often get is, of course, is that it's all about this, the sensuality. Um, and the irony of that is that the majority of romance readers are happily married. They're not trying to um, use it vicariously for that reason. What they're doing is they want that magic of falling in love again, that hope of of finding forever after. I mean, most of us only fall in love once, twice, you know, maybe three times in our entire lives. And it's the most wonderful feeling in the world. So it's their way of re of experiencing that again. And, and so with, with a romance novel, you can pick it up and experience it again and again and again, you know, so it's more about, uh, you know, the sensuality is the frosting on the cake, I like to say, but the, the uh, underlying cake is the, you know, two people finding each other and it ending so hopefully and feeling that first drunken feeling of falling in love is really what what people are after. When when you've written as many books as you have, uh, Brenda, do you ever uh, have trouble looking for new subjects for new characters? Um, ha- have you ever just just been dry? And and if so, what do you do to uh, you know? Do you take vacations? What 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 do you do to kind of restoke? the fire or to fill up your creative bucket? The thing that works best for me is reading. I mean, as soon as I get into another book, someone else's book that I love, I'll be like, oh, it just makes me want to write again. And that's what The Four Winds just did to me reading that for, like I said, our our March featured author for my my online book group. I just loved that book so much that it got my imagination just stoked and it made me really want to read or I mean, write. So the best thing for me, if, if I ever start feeling that writer fatigue or where do I go next or it's, it's becoming flat to me or boring, all I have to do is, is jump into another really good book. Sometimes movies can work for me, too. Like if I watch Last of the Mohicans, which is one of my favorite, it'll jumpstart my muse because it just that sweeping music and that 
passionate love story. It just gets me excited all over again. The um, the trappings of, of modern technology have been the bane of, of many a writer. Uh, you know, we as opposed to the mid 90s when you began, um, you know, now we're all plugged into the Internet 24 uh, seven. You know, we are communicating on social media and we you know, other people have access to us like we have access to other people like never before. Um, and and some people don't don't know how to quite uh, compartmentalize, uh, you know, the uh, the connected nature of our lives now. Um, has has it ever been a challenge for you or do you see the Internet and the connected nature um, of, of, of how society is? Now? Do you think that that's good for writers? Um, how, how has has that impacted you personally and and the uh, and and the business throughout the years. Well, I think because most writers are introverts, some of them might find that challenging. Except it is in the best format for them, meaning they can do it behind their computer. They don't have to get up in front of people if they're introverts. For me, it's been a great blessing, especially through COVID, because it's enabled me to connect directly with my readers in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do before. And I have, as I mentioned, this online book group, and there's, you know, almost 19,000 members in there, and they're just hugely avid readers and hugely supportive. And we do book buddies, and we do monthly meetings, and we throw parties, and we do bingo Ted, you know, or we have bingo all through the spring and summer with my husband, they call him bingo Ted. And we just have become um, where we've forged such friendships and offered support to each other through this really difficult time. Many of them are older and couldn't see their children or grandchildren. They were lonely. And it just kind of gave everybody um, something to look forward to, hopefully, and an outlet. And so it's made us all closer because of the the difficulties of the past year. So I'm I'm addicted to to my computer, whether I'm writing or whether I'm on social media. Um, I just I absolutely love my book group. I love the people on my Facebook page and thoroughly enjoy them and try to offer as much fun content as I possibly can. The new book is The Bookstore on the Beach. Like I said earlier, this is a must have. Um, this book is so much fun. And uh, I, I just found myself just tearing through the pages. I, I know other people are going to do the same. Um, we're going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode uh, where you can get it in hardcover or Kindle edition or audio book. Uh, Brenda, what do you think about the the recent um uh, explosion of, of audiobooks. I mean, audiobooks have been around for a very long time, but the last couple of years, uh, the market has just really just just caught on fire. Um, how, what do you think about uh, audiobooks and, and having your works translated to audio? I love audio. I'm an Audible member, so I get a you know credit every month, and I'm Me always too. eager to spend it. And I love that. I think it, it it speaks to how busy our lives are. We can listen to these books while we work out, while we drive, and of course we could do that before, but it it was it was more clunky, right? Right now we just stream everything, which makes it so easy. You just put on any book you want, and um, without having to go out, visit a store, buy the stuff, you know, put it in the you know have the player for it, um, like like we used to have to do plus it was was more expensive back then than it is now most books are only $15 and I, I remember those being 30 to 60 some of them sure. the big ones um, so you know prices have come down making it more accessible um, I you know we have our airpods from from Apple so we don't even have you know those have to hold on to anything they're just in our ears as we go about vacuuming or whatever we're doing of course you can't I guess vacuuming is not a good example it's too loud but dusting or whatever um, so I just I love that I can can do both uh, and and always have a good book going on audible absolutely we're going to put links where you can get it in any format that you like in the show notes of this episode Brenda I know that you have a fantastic website uh, full of, of information for people uh, if people want to dig into all the great stuff that you're doing where can they find you Brenda Novak dot com and if they do get a copy of the bookstore on the beach, make sure um, that they have them let me know at news at brendanovac.com because I will send them a free novella called Pieces of Perfect that I wrote just as a thank you to those who supported my new book. And I'd love to send it to them. Fantastic. Uh, we'll be sure to put a link uh, to that in the show notes as well. Uh, Brenda, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, 
look no further than Pico's house. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. Are you looking for software that helps you bring your novel to life? Novelize is a web-based writing app which allows you to access your work on any device with a browser and an internet connection. Write from your desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Just get the novel written. Say goodbye to sticky notes. With our notebook on the side, you can keep track of all the important information you need to write your novel. We keep distractions to a minimum help you track your progress and encourage you to write more novels. You can even use the same notebook for your novels in a series. Outline, write, or organize your novel by switching between modes. You can write your outline notes while you're writing, and you can move scenes and chapters around anytime in the organized mode. Choose between the dark and light theme to help prevent eye strain so that you can stay immersed in your book. Novelize, the app for writers by writers.